right. Let's get into a new sermon series. We have... Are you excited? You excited about what it is? I have a surprise for you, I tell you. We have long talked about the Holy Spirit, and we have moved through the Easter series. And, and now I want to start a new series that is called Breaking Follow Ground. Breaking Follow Ground. Is there a little bit of an echo or something? I kind of hear a little bit of a feedback. Should we? I think that's better now. Okay. Breaking Follow Ground. You know what? I had to look up what follow even means because uh, I don't know if... Do you know what follow ground means? Really? Nobody? Just, just a couple? You know, I had to, thanks to Wikipedia, I had to look it up um, because there's two scriptures in, in the Bible where it talks about breaking follow ground. And follow ground is when you, you, have, you have a piece of land... All the farmers in here, raise your arm, hand. All the farmers, come on, we have farmers in here, right? So, <laughs> well, <laughs> they're in the fields right now, that's right. All, but all the farmers, they know probably what this means to have follow ground because it is a ground that, that you have not cultivated, that you have not done anything with. So you decided for one year or a couple of years to just let it grow, whatever grows on it. So you're not cultivating it. You're not plowing it. You're not uh, throwing seeds out there. You're not harvesting. From, you just completely abandon it. You just completely leave it alone. And what happens with a large patch of soil and ground when you just completely leave it by itself? You've got a ton of weeds, right? You've got a ton of weeds. And at this stage, that ground becomes hard. It becomes crusted. It, there is no fruit coming from it. There is no harvest coming from it. And there's just weeds growing. And you walk through that thing. And maybe the deer like it to walk through something like this. But nobody else does because there's thistles and there's heavy stuff. And uh, it's, it's not good. It's not a pleasant land. And this is what the Lord calls plow that thing and turn it back into a fruitful and, and, and multiplication soil where you can throw out seeds and it multiplies, it grows. But in order to gain that harvest, you have to work that ground again and you have to break up that fallow ground. And this scripture is from Jeremiah chapter 4. So you can already turn there. This is Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. There's two passages and I'm, I'm going to mention the other one as well. But let's dwell on this one for a second. Um, I kind of felt like for a while, the Lord put on, on my heart to preach a sermon series about the parable of the sower. And so this, this is what this sermon series is going to lead into. We're going to be talking about the parable of the sower because there is four different kinds of ground, right? You remember that? There's four different kinds of ground, but I want this scripture here in the Old Testament to be the foundation for everything because that is really the, the message that God is trying to get us uh, across. We got to break up that wild grown land, that, that fallow ground that is somehow not cultivated in our personal life. And I'll just read the scripture here really quick. It's a small passage. Um, this is in uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. And thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and, and sow not among thorns. Okay? Break up this fallow ground and stop sowing basically in between those thorns that are growing, that are coming up from that fallow ground. People are just trying to cultivate and, and sow seeds in between all that weed that is growing on that field. And he goes on, he says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. Wow. Now there is something there. You know, the, the context, let me just explain this really quick. In the context, we have here the prophet of Jeremiah, and he is called to, to prophesy to a Jerusalem. So he has a message for Jerusalem. And if you remember, Jeremiah was the prophet 
that was that God called to office to, to minister just before the destruction of Jerusalem, before God had to remove them into exile. And they were in exile for how many years? 70 years, right? So God had to remove them because they started with their own religion and with their own stuff and, and, and failed to listen to God continually. And so Jeremiah is one of the prophets that God called in this time and season to prophesy to a Jerusalem. Uh, during this time, uh, God had already brought Israel, the northern tribes, into captivity and now it's just Judah that is left and God already had chastised the whole nation and even Judah does not turn even Judah does not start obeying God and listening to God so God's like man it's like it's five minutes to midnight it's it's close the 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 the, the time is at hand um, you, you got to change you got to turn around you know and when I think about our society in which we live today I kind of feel like man there's a lot of uh, parallels right there um, uh, he was living in, in a town of Judah that was called Anadoth. Anadoth is, is one of four towns that were dedicated only for priests uh, that were serving uh, as priests in Israel. And what they had assigned four towns. And so he was living in, four, in one of those uh, towns, and that's approximately two miles northeast. And so as Jeremiah was, was walking up toward it, he was just seeing that, that glory, that what, what God wanted to have for Israel, the presence of God in Israel, and he was ministering there. But then the king that was reigning here five years, at the last five years as, as Jeremiah was, was, no, sorry, five years as Jeremiah was prophesying, there was the last five years of Josiah. Josiah the king of, of Judah, and he was actually one of only two kings. Of all the kings of Israel, there were only two kings that actually remained faithful to God. And it was after five years of Jeremiah preaching and preaching and preaching and prophesying to Jeru uh, Jerusalem and Israel and, and Judah, Josiah, after five years of that, he finally listened and he led uh, Judah into religious reform. Uh, he removed all the idol worship uh, from, uh, fr from all the hills. There were hills with Asherah poles and just everything. and they, they made their own religion. And so he led this reform. He removed everything that was detestable to God and turned the nation around. But then when he passed away, the next guy after him, the king Jehoiakim, um, he was like one of he was like the, the biggest enemy of Jeremiah. He did not listen to anything that Jeremiah had to say. He went against and he brought back own religion again. He did not want what God had for Israel, what God had for the Jews, but he wanted to bring in his own stuff again. Homemade, self-made religion again. Come on, Lord, let's worship here, let's worship there, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that, and we call it our faith and our religion, and it's all good. And that's how, how we get the blessing of, of God on us, and uh, we, our crops are going to grow and flourish, and God is like, what, really? Without me? Like, you just do it without me, right? And so God's blessing cannot rest on that, and we know that. And so eventually God then brought, brought all of, of Judah at this point. There was the, the ransack, the, the city of Jerusalem. It was uh, a, a gruesome picture, all of it. And, and God just took them into captivity and had to teach them another lesson. You know, I think about the time in which we live right now. And I, I kind of feel like, I, I don't know, I think we all sense it, that we live at the decisive point in history. We, amen, right? Yes. We live at the decisive point in history. And we, we are like, as a, not only as a church, not only in our personal life, but as a nation together, we are at the threshold. At the threshold. Damn yet this word this morning. We are like at the threshold. We are, we are, God wants, I know God wants to lead us into something, but there's like this stained glass barrier in between. And it's so hard. There's something, there's a resistance, there's a barrier. And what do you do? Do, do we shrink back in fear? It's like, no, let, 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 let's go home and let, let's, let's obey everything that's going on. And, um, you know, we, we, however our religion looks like that, that is man made here. Because right now we're getting told what to believe and what not to believe what is truth and what is not truth did you ever become confused within this last year about what is truth and what is lie 
Like, whoa. I mean, I've been living here now since uh, five and a half years, and it was never that confusing. Just like this, this last year, it is super confusing. And we as a nation, we have come to a threshold. We have come to a decisive point, and it is at this point where each one of us and us as a nation together, where we need to decide for reform, do we reform or do we abide uh, with everything that's going on right now? And we know what it leads to. It will lead to decay. Everything will fall apart. Everything, uh, God's blessing cannot rest on it. But it's, it's evil always, always has a tendency to fall apart. When God created, God created order. Without God's creation, there, there was a void. There was chaos, right? There's nothing there. So if God removes his order, if God removes his hand, if God removes his blessing, things start falling That's apart. Right. Yes. And one of, the, one of the things that evil always does, it's a downward spiral. It always does. Read Romans chapter 1. <laughs> Even though uh, he, God's nature was clearly depicted in, in, in creation, they did not worship God for who he was, but turned to worthless idols. And therefore, what did God do? He said, all right, I'll take a step back. That's all that God has to do. God doesn't like a whack-a-mole. God doesn't take a sledgehammer and beat down on our life. You know, God, sometimes all he does is like, all right, you try it. Did you ever do that with your kids? It's like, all right, you, you try it. You want to touch that stove? Uh, you know, I don't know. God sometimes, he takes a step back. If we fail to obey, if we fail to live the life that God has ordained for us, then sometimes all that God is, has left is take a step back and say, and then what, what starts to begin then is a downward spiral decay and falling, up, falling apart. That's what's, what's launching them from this, place, from this point onward. But on the other side, if there is turning back to God, how many times? I said only two kings in Israel were actually faithful to God, and then it always led to a time period of blessing, of peace, of rest. We all want peace and blessing and rest, right? But only two of them, everybody else, all the other kings, um, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Do you remember that? It's like over and over and over again. He, and, he, he, and he became king and he reigned for so and so long and he did evil. And he did more evil than all the other kings before. Going down in history as the most evil king ever uh, in, in Israel. It's crazy. But God wants to bless. God wants to, to... He brought Israel into the promised land that flows from milk and honey. And in the land of blessing is when all of this happened. Do we grasp that? In the land, in the promise that God has for us. We, we, when, when we give our lives to the Lord, we enter into this rest. We enter into the blessing of the Lord. God wants to remove all the trash from our life and leads us into a renewal of our mind. He wants to lead us into a new life. But in this life of blessing, we can completely mess it up. We can completely mess it up by just doing our own religion and just living our own life and just doing what pleases us instead of looking at what pleases the Lord. I, I, in, lately, God just shows me this scripture, and I love a, a scripture that I un un underlined in one of my Bibles when I was a teenager, actually. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will grant you the, the, the desires of your heart. What Did you ever contemplate about it, what it means to delight yourself in something? You know, it's not just coming to church. It's, it's not just praying every once in a while. If you find delight in something, man, this is where you want to be, right? If we find delight in something, then we, we can wait to get back into that place. We want to talk with that person. If we find a spouse, we, we're delighted in, in the presence of a spouse. We want to talk with that person continually. The Lord wants us to delight ourselves in Him, to find that pleasure, not in other places, but in God. And only if we turn away from that, and if we don't want any of that, then it starts to decay and things start to fall apart. And this is really the background here of, the, of, of Jeremiah too. Let me just read here a couple passages. In, in chapter 2, for example, verse 11, 
Um, it says, has a nation changed its gods? <laughs> you know, just like changing clothes. It's like, doesn't fit anymore. I don't like it anymore. Tomorrow I want to wear something new, right? It's not in fashion anymore. Tomorrow I'll go with something else. And this is what God says to Israel. Has a nation changed its gods? Even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their, their glory. For what does not profit? Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. The fountain of living waters. Remember, I talked about this once. The fountain, God is the source of all living water. Not stale, not dirty, not reeking water, but living fresh water. In God, there is all this freshness. <laughs> he is the source. But they have forsaken that fountain of li living water where continually new and fresh life comes out of. And instead, this is what they did. But they hound out cisterns uh, for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot even hold water so just coming up with their own stuff and just trying to keep it together with the things you know every one of us that has before we ever started tithing you know in, into God's kingdom before we started tithing to the Lord something has happened we notice that we try to keep things together but the more we try to keep things together the more it drains and the more we lose it. But if we want to lose it for the kingdom of God, if we invest it in the kingdom of God, every one of us who's tried that knows a testimony like that. Because if we're trying to do it our, in our own way, then it does lead to decay and God's blessing cannot rest on it. All of our life, our marriages, our, 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 our parenting with our children, everything that we do should glorify the Lord. Everything that we should do should be in the context of what God, what life God wants us to live with Him. Amen? In verse 21, yeah, just a second, this is still in, uh, in chapter 2. Yet I planted, and this is what God says, yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. God, God did an awesome job. He had the best field and he planted the most precious seeds there. And that's, that, that's the nation, Israel. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild wine? Wow. In chapter 3, verse 23, um, it uh, goes on where it says, but from your youth, the shameful things have devoured all for which our fathers have labored, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame and let our dishonor cover us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth to this day, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. And, the, and here's an outcry of the Lord. And it says, if you return, O Israel, if you return, or Israel, I still have those words uh, sounding in, in my mind when Jonathan Kahn at Capitol Hill was saying this, today is the day of repentance. If we return, he had the potter's jar in his hands. Do you remember that? That's such a picture for our nation. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me uh, you should return. If you remove the detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and goes on then. God wants us to come back to him and to follow him. In chapter 12, um, just really quick, in chapter 12, verse 10, same thing. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. What God is trying to plant, many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard and have trampled down my portion. And those are religious leaders or, or people that, that try to lead, but they really, they, they just mess up what God is planting by faith, what God is planting in his son, Jesus Christ, the kingdom that God is establishing. They have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Desolate, it mourns to me. Wow. It talks about this when God is planting, when God is, and it's always this farming language somehow, God is really into farming, I tell you. It's the best analogy that we can learn for ourselves that God, this between planting, cultivating the ground and, and planting and, and harvest, all of scripture, even in, in Revelation, in the end, it talks about the harvest, 
the great harvest. It's all God uses, uh, loves to use this language. And now let's go back to our verse here. It, and in all of this, when people are going about their own way, Israel has forsaken. The northern kingdom God has already removed. And here is the south, southern kingdom now, Judah. And they're still not listening. They're still just doing their own stuff on the uh, and the Jehoiakim, the, one of the, the, the kings, the evil kings, he just made a self-made religion again and just abandoned anything that God had for them. And in the midst of all this comes this outcry from God, an outcry from God for his people. And I, I want, I, I, when I read this passage and with uh, the parable of the sword and later in, in the New Testament, and I'm not going to go into it today. Today is really an introduction for all of it. Um, but there is so much stuff there where I feel like we need to cultivate the ground for God. And we need to cultivate. There is a lot of junk that should not be there. There is a lot of stuff that hinders that growth. When it says, don't throw your seeds among the thistles. I was like, what are we trying to think? To, to, to grow a fruitful crop right under thorn bush? It, it just doesn't work that way. God wants us to cultivate our ground. And this outcry of God here in the midst of all this is uh, th that sermon title, Break Up Your Follow Ground. And this is, um, again, uh, chapter 4, Your Follow Ground. And sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins from your hearts. You know, when it talks about break up this fallow ground, here's a question. Do you think that God spoke to Israel about their agricultural skill? No, right? God did not talk to Israel about that they're not doing a good job farming. God was talking to them about their spiritual life, their spiritual state, and it was what, what is bringing fruit in their life. God wanted to bless their life. God wanted to use this nation as a, as a, a marking point for all the nations through which God can bless all the earth. Through the nation Israel, God wanted to do that, but he could not. He really is talking about their own personal life, about how they're just abandoning it and going back into their own stuff, making up their own religion. And when it says here, do not sow among thorns. This parable of the sower strikes us very strong because we have four uh, different kinds of soils, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, from next week on. The other, in, in verse 4, it says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskin. So he talks about two different things. He talks about the sowing aspect and then he talks about actually the whole circumcision aspect. In the Old Testament, we have circumcision, right? Even in the New Testament, we have circumcision, but even Paul says circumcision is nothing, right? It's our personal life. It's our personal faith to God that is everything. Here in the Old Testament, the old, I'm not going to go deep into circumcision, but just know that circumcision hurts, right? I think we, we can all kind of... Uh, I get that in, in our minds. Circumcision is something that a, a newborn was dedicated at the temple, was brought to God, and then on the eighth day was circumcised. But it hurts. When adults have to be circumcised for three days, they were out. They had like fever coming and everything. It hurts. You know, it, it's, but it, it's like God is requesting here of Israel, it's like, if you want to follow me, if you want to be part of me, allow it to hurt your life. Allow it to, to remove something from you that, you know, remove something and just follow me because I've got something. I want you to be part of my flock. I want you to be part of the blessing of what I have for you. And when God is already demanding it in the Old Testament in a physical way, but he even in the Old, this is, we're speaking about the Old, this is not New Testament, this is Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, while they were still living the tradition of circumcision, he said, but remember, Remove them, not just about the flesh, but he said, remove the foreskins from your hearts. Wow, I mean, there is something like in the flesh it hurts. We cannot expect to remove the foreskin from our hearts and for it not to hurt. 
It's got to hurt. It's, it's got to be a sacrifice. If we, David said, my sacrifice must cost me something. You know, when, when uh, one of them, he, he came to, to somebody and was like, hey, can I have a bull from you? And he says, oh, it's free of charge. And he says, no, 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 no. It's got to cost me something. It, it's, it only is real if it costs us something. David understood that. For us, it's the same thing. When, when we are being called to circumcise circumcise our hearts it's like remove this it's the stuff that we love it's the stuff that we hang over that, that, that we cling to that we focus on that we're so fixated on all this stuff that preoccupies our heart and God says well remove this stuff so that it can be completely dedicated to me that's what God is speaking and that's that is ultimately what releases a new spiritual day and another new spiritual day. And we start growing. And we start moving from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Amen? In James chapter 4, it, there, there is a passage of, about how we spend the, the freedom of God. Um, in James chapter... Just a second. Mixing it there up here. In James chapter 4, verse uh, 3, it says, uh, You ask, but you do not receive because you ask wrongly. You spend it on your passions. You know, very often we want all the blessings from God. We want everything that God has for our life. But then what do we do with it? Do we start living that life of God? Do we start living it? Or do we move back into our old lives? But it says, do you spend it on your passions? And then he calls out your adulterous people. You do not... Uh, know that friendship with the world is enmity to God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it says for no purpose when, when the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that God has made to dwell in us. We have the spirit of God inside of us. And God wants to have fellowship with that spirit. God wants to lead us from one degree to another degree. You know, we wonder sometimes in our life while we see little fruit and little change. Our family, there's nothing moving. At our workplace, nothing is moving forward. With our kids, we, so, we don't see that redemption of our children that we are praying for uh, day after day, week after week, and month after month. Why do we not uh, see fruit coming out? We labor, we labor, but the harvest is not there and the, the crop is not going out. Perhaps... It is because we're sowing in the wrong places. Perhaps it is because we're sowing on the thorns. We're sowing on a ground that is all crusted up. Let, let's go to the parable, and this is in, in Matthew chapter 13. So next week onward, I'm going to be talking about um, the parable of the sower, but I really want all of us to prepare our hearts for this sermon series right now. Because there is something that we are as a church and we are individually at the threshold of something new. But God cannot take us there if we continue in those same ways. If that ground is still hard and crusted up. If we're sowing to the path. If we're sowing on rocky ground. If we sow among thorns. There's only one out of four that is a good ground. <laughs> right? Just think about our personal life. There's only maybe a quarter of our personal life that we live that really brings the fruit. And it can be hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirtyfold fruit. All of a sudden, we see those blessings of God growing. But there's, there's three other thirds in our life that really does not yield any fruit, right? And the parable of the sower here, we're going to get into that the next week. Um, but... Let's just read it, because we're going to read it every single time anyway. And the same day, uh, Jesus went uh, out of the house, and he sat by the sea, and the great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into a boat, and he sat down, and the whole crowd stood at the beach, and he told them many things in parables. But one of the things was, he said, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell among the path. And the birds came, and they devoured them. So what, what do the birds do here? They steal it, right? The birds stole it. Keep in your mind the word steal. 
Other seeds, on the other hand, fell among rocky ground. And when they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, and since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. They died. The sun killed those plants, killing, stealing, killing, and the other one is destroying. We have that passage. And since they have no roots, uh, the sun came and scorched them. Verse 8, and some of the seeds, they, uh, sorry, and seven, yes, you're right. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns and, and, and the thorns grew up, so the thorns, the, the weed in our life, that, that stuff that doesn't even belong there, is growing up and is actually choking them. It choked up and it's destroying them. You know, we have that passage in, in uh, John 10, 10, <laughs> that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, we wonder sometimes why, we're, why there is not much moving in our life. And maybe it is because we have sown in the wrong places. Maybe we have allowed too much seed, too much of our investments, too much, too much of our thoughts, too much of our heart, too much of our passion to be sown where the enemy can come and snatch it away, where the enemy can come and steal it away, or where it's trampled out on, underfoot. The Gospel of Luke talks about it. Well, we'll get into it next time. Um, and then uh, when, <laughs> when the sun scorches it and, and, and it gets killed, um, you know, there's something about this when the sun comes up and it just shrivels up. It has no roots. Uh, sometimes we see something spring up in our life and we have this devotion life and we have this prayer life, but then it just takes a little while and it's just all gone again. It's because it has no roots. It doesn't go down deep. It doesn't become a habit of our life. It doesn't become our daily life somehow. And then when it's choked up by other things, sometimes we just sow our seeds on the thorns where we know it gets choked up. I want us to prepare our hearts for that because I believe we live in a day and age where we have to be very mindful and very careful. We cannot live the same lifestyle anymore as all the years before. You know, even back then, it was not good enough. But now it really shows that it's not good enough. And, and that's the point. God wants to do a new thing. God doesn't want us to fall back. He doesn't want us to shrink back. He doesn't want the enemy to come in and steal from us or to kill from us or to destroy the things that God has given us. God doesn't want that. God wants to bless our lives and he wants us to walk in this blessing. So as we move forward and next week onward, I, I want you to read this passage and just read it in different translations, study it really, and start praying about it. Now, yeah, come on up. And start praying about it and, and feel if maybe, the, if maybe there is something in this parable of the sower where you can identify your life with. Maybe the Lord is, is, is showing you something where you feel like the enemy is choking this stuff up the whole time. Or the enemy has been stealing from you. And he has been killing your passion. Maybe you walked passionate at some point and all of a sudden there is no passion there anymore in your life. Allow allow this all of this sermon series to really spurn us into coming to the threshold where the stained glass barrier is god wants to take us through the stained glass barrier but we got to lose stuff in our life we got to lose stuff in our life and we we got to sow to the things that really do bear manifold fruit amen